Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to The Caring View, the online health and social care platform, free and available to everybody across the UK. We are connecting nations tonight. It is not just England. We have the wonderful Scotland, and I'm still waiting for Hadrian's Wall to come down past Lancashire and take me into your, your warm embrace. I want to come with you. Before we get started, don't forget to hit subscribe. Tap that bell if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're on Facebook, tough luck. I don't know what's going on. We're not connecting you to you tonight. I'm going to have to look into that. It's throwing up an error. But if you're on LinkedIn, yes, definitely. Please enjoy. Please uh, give us a follow. www.thecaringview.co.uk. You can find out everything about us on there. Watch all of our previous episodes. Listen to our current podcast series. Download our free resources. Connect with us. And find out all of our suppliers that we have worked with and will continue to work with in the future. <gasps> Mark, hello. How are you? Yes, not too bad. How are you? I'm good. I, I am very quiet last week, and I must apologise. I had flu, um, and I thought I was just getting over the worst of it, and I am absolutely fine, um, but I'm going to go for the sympathy card. I got hit by a car last night, which was just horrid. I was driving on a roundabout, and I got hit by a car, and I feel really sorry for myself. So if anyone wants to send me some well wishes, I will I will take them and apply them to my damaged rear vehicle um because it's just such a shame but other than that i am fabulous thank you very much now we've got two super duper guests with us tonight we have got twitter royalty with us um kirsty and we have got Alison vale previous guest on our show and huge presence in social care within scotland kirsty i'm going to come to yourself first because you use your real name here but you go by a different name on X now, isn't it? Let's call it X. Let's keep their branding up. Give us an introduction to who you are. Yeah, I am Kirsty Carton, but I go by Just a Care Home Girl on Twitter. Um, I am the manager of Rashley Care Home in Erskine, um, which for anyone who probably doesn't know where Erskine is, especially if you don't live anywhere near her, um, it's not too far from Glasgow. Um, I have always been a care home nurse and now a manager. So I'm very, very passionate about care homes and now very passionate about using my voice to change that perception. And I'm very Honestly. worried that I have a cat that's right behind me, right beside my lamp. So if I go dark in a minute, it's because of the cat. <laughs> well, it can't be better than Alison being bathed in a heavenly halo that everyone's just missed because it's mellowed out now. But it was quite intense when it first happened, Alison, back in the green room. Alison, for everyone who doesn't know you, please give us a reintroduction. And welcome, Kirsty, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, I know. I'm really disappointed my halo hasn't come with me, but hopefully it might reappear. Who knows? Uh, yeah, so my name's Alison Vale, and I am a business operations director for Abbotsford Care, which is a family run care home group based in Fife. Um, but I also like to do a lot of little things on the side. And um, that's why I kind of like to call myself a creative producer. And I was kind of humming and hawing about whether I was going to put that on there tonight. But I've decided to claim it, to be here and to own it uh, and to kind of run with that title. So yeah, that's me and that's what we do here in Fife. And you are a real creative producer, not like these people who work at Subway and call themselves sandwich artists. You are a creative producer and it is fantastic to have you here with us tonight. Mark, Mark, Mark. The show tonight, what are we discussing with our fabulous guests? Yes, so tonight we're talking about um, creative spaces and how we can utilise our online presence um, to influence something that we're passionate about. Obviously, we're gonna talk about social care, but it could be anything. And it kind of follows on from a conversation that Alison very kindly invited me to at the GAN, camp, GAN conference um, in Scotland, um, which I, I mean, I'll let Alison talk more about it, but I could overhear the com comments at the very end about how well it was um, well received and just some of the bits and pieces and the that it was food for thought. And I thought, actually, let's carry on that conversation. And I think, the downside with all these conferences is they're never recorded. So unless you're there, you never get to see it again. So I thought, why not jump on here, have that conversation, and then it'll be recorded and online forever. Alison, did you want to talk more about kind of where the idea came from and that game conference? Yeah, sure. So, uh, gosh, that feels like such a long time ago, but also sure only yesterday. Does. Kind of my pre-post-COVID sense of time has just completely disappeared, I think, knowing how far things gone. But, um, yeah, so I actually was uh, working with Caroline Dean, who is the workforce uh, policy lead from Scottish Care. Um, and GAN conference was coming up and we were like, oh, 
oh, we really want to be part of this, but we don't really know what we're going to do. What can, what can we talk about? Like, what do we feel like we could kind of really kind of set out into the into the space? Um, and alongside a colleague of mine, um, Ivan Cornford, who has a care uh, and um, we had started up a creative collaborative for social care influencers um, last year. Uh, last year, maybe two, it's probably two years now, Christy, isn't it? I can't really think how long it's been. Um, but really what we wanted to kind of explore was the idea of creating creative spaces for people. Um, and when we had kind of put the feelers out there on how we were going to do that, myself and Ivan, we decided to do it at the V&A, which was a very physical space. But what we were so conscious of was that the people we brought together in that space in that time, the network that we began to kind of grow and grow in what we call hive mind now, um, was really about bringing people together who were just all super keen and really interested to just take something to the next level in terms of like where we're going and what we're doing. So we actually was really inspired by Adam and he probably doesn't know this, but like I think Adam a long time ago had said like on his uh, Facebook or stuff, I was really inspired and he put like social care influencer and I went, hell yeah, we're going to hold that. We're going to own that because actually like in the in all of these things, I think sometimes as providers especially and people who are working in the care home sector we can kind of um feel a bit lost and not necessarily feel confident in who we are and what we're doing and how we're doing things and there's so much great work that happens all of the time and i think it was just about creating a space where that could be amplified and could be kind of encouraged and um supported which is why we created hive mind and then hive mind led us on to do the workshop at gan with caroline and myself um and it really is about thinking about how can we claim this sort of social care influence in space and think about how we could all work together to amplify the voices of the people we are um, the people we're supporting, whether that's our staff that are working with us or our residents that we're, we're supporting and caring for, our relatives, but also just allow um, ourselves to be a vehicle of good stuff and of positive influence. And um, I think I said at that gang conference, you know, I think what I love about a social media space is that anyone can be a social care influencer, uh, anyone can be an influencer. There is no power there's no visible power dynamic. And especially in somewhere like a space like X these days, where anyone can pay for a blue tick now. So it doesn't matter whether you've got 10 million followers or whether you've got two followers, you have a space in place to make your voice be heard. And I think that's really important to building people's confidence and growing the innovation that we can have in that for that reason. So yeah, that was kind of what we were exploring and talking about. And uh, Mark was really kind to kind of come on board and all the work that you guys have been doing and, and the caring view and the space that you've created here um, and how much that has kind of been an influence to loads of people. Um, and how can we continue to support people to grow in confidence to just say what they want to say and not be frightened? Because I think for too long, we've all been a bit frightened to actually say what we want to say. and. Um, but I do also really think that we need to remember and be kind and it's World Kindness Day today. So I think it's important to make sure that when we're creating those spaces that they're created and, you know, with psychological safety, that they're here about supporting each other and about especially I think when it's come out of COVID where support is really what everyone's wanted and needed moving forward. No, thank you very much. So I guess most people that are viewing tonight are on social media so we can see there's an issue with our facebook live for some reason tonight but i can see there are people on linkedin joining um and also youtube and i know youtube isn't really kind of a platform that we really think about when it comes to social media um but for anybody thinking actually i'm on social media i might do a bit of posting about things here and now actually i want to actually i want to own the space i want to become maybe not even an influencer just share their views more and Kirsty, I'm going to come to you. How did, how did you get started? Because obviously you're a very prominent figure over on X or Twitter or whatever we might be calling it these days. Um, yeah, how did you get started? And then that kind of momentum to be posting, because you obviously post quite a lot as well. I mean, you've gone from posting kind of about personal life and work life and amalgamation of both. And yeah, are you able to talk us through that journey? So... I really didn't bother with Twitter at all um, until probably not long before the pandemic and went to a few Scottish care events and they tweet everything. So I kind of thought, well, everyone else is tweeting, so why not have a wee look and see? Uh, before that, everything was just personal on Facebook. Um, 
joined Twitter and kind of thought, it actually, I suppose the passion side of things was the reason I joined. I wanted to do it through a more work-focused thing initially. And at that time, even before the pandemic, there was so much emphasis on NHS nurses, on NHS as a whole, and social care was just completely forgotten about. Nobody talked about social care. Um, but being a care home nurse and having always been a care home nurse, I was very passionate about it. So it, it kind of ha- the name kind of happened just by chance. I was driving down the road with the family in the car, and there was, I was as I always do, just getting moany with my husband and moaning about everything, uh, moaning about how social care just gets lost all the time. And then we decided to put the radio on, and it was journeys don't stop believing. So you can kind of get the analogy there of where just a care home girl came in, but at the same time. I kind of made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to change that until people were actually respected and valued in social care. Um, and sadly, I don't think we're, we're there yet, so the name remains. But it did very much become so powerful during the pandemic, um, partly because it was about advocating for our residents who weren't getting testing, who weren't getting access to the staff and the residents, there was no PPE, all these things that nobody seemed to know about. And it was like, how can nobody know about this? They will look at the news and it's all about the hospitals, but nobody's seeing what's happening inside care homes. And from the other perspective, people are seeing a very sad story of people sitting around, staring at each other with no visitors. And we strived to make that not the case we were going to be fighting every single day to make sure that everybody was still living a meaningful life um, and doing the best we could to make it a happy life despite all the regulations that were in place so it became a very much a place where it was a broadcast to the outside world both for information but also for comfort for some for families Um, and for me personally it became a comfort in finding other people that were doing the same job as me. I only took over the manager of um, the care home six months before the pandemic. Um, So despite having been deputy for a long time and having experience of management, nobody knew what to do when it became, when the COVID hit. So being a new manager, it was a complete baptism of fire and management's a really lonely place at times. There's no, there wasn't somebody else on par with me that I could talk to. Um, at some points even my deputy wasn't there because she got seconded to another home and um, meeting that tribe of people on Twitter who were going through similar things um, really was, it was great for me to be able to find a network that I could connect with, that I could hook in with and say, listen, I'm really not sure about this, what do you think? But also to see that they were actually using their voices And to me, that was just inspiration, thinking, well, you know what? I'm not on my own here. If I stand up here and stick my head above the parapet, I'm not going to get it chopped off straight away because there's other people that feel just as passionately about things as I do. So it did very much come to light during the pandemic. And since then, it's really been about changing that narrative about care homes, that care homes aren't sad places where people sit and stare at each other all day, that actually people live meaningful lives. That there's people out there who want to live in care homes and choose to live in care homes. It's not like a sentence and put on people. Um, And I think the more that I've been on it, I've posted the odd wee thing about more personal things as well. And that's really just to, it's about vulnerability and just showing people that, yeah, I'm a care home manager and that, but I'm human. I have kids that do awkward things and show me up. And I have a parent that I care for as well. So it's, and to me, that's actually reaching out to other networks. So it's it's building those networks of people in different environments. And the more we listen to other people's stories, the more we learn. And it really is the case, isn't it? Because, Mark, you and I, we wouldn't be doing the Care in View today if it had not been for social media and we hadn't connected. So for those who don't know, Mark and I don't live anywhere near each other geographically. Kirsty, Alison, you've been explaining where you're from in Scotland and if you know where this place is and you know where that place is. And I tell this everyone, I used to think Tokyo was in Japan, so do not give me a location. I will never find a place on a map. I can't do it. I am useless. Like, useless. 
I think talky sounds Japanese. That was my excuse. I just didn't know. As, but Mark and I only connected through meeting on social media, and that was through sharing our own experiences, sharing what we were going through, and sharing our knowledge to others as well, saying, look, we will support you. Yeah, we're going through the ringer ourselves, and oh my gosh, I'm drowning every single day, but I still have time to support other people. And Mark, that's really what we've, I mean, I say this is what we've been about. Mark's, I'm going to say it, number one followed social care professional in the entire UK on LinkedIn is crazy. But Mark, that's how we met, and that's really what the Karen View is about, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I think, I mean, I was I was never really on LinkedIn. I had an account, and I wasn't really active. And I had Twitter, and I was and I wasn't active. I'd done, obviously, a few of the petitions with Greenpeace and Bits and Pieces in Iceland kind of pre-pandemic, which is why I was only on Twitter because the change.org had recommended actually the best place to reach journalists were on Twitter. And then I was just kind of really present on Facebook groups, which is obviously where I met yourself, Adam. And I think we kind of had very similar values in terms of what you, like what you were saying, Kirsty. actually, we didn't want to stop visiting. And actually, how can we support others to do that? And it was a very lonely place at that time. I think for me, I obviously was away from the kids and, and my wife. And I just thought, you know what, I, I'm just sat here doing nothing. Like I might as well utilize my time and support people, whether that's, you know, a stupid video on Facebook, whether that's, you know, a document or a resource or however I can support or whether that's somebody just dropping me a WhatsApp. And yeah, I think you and I, Adam, were doing very similar things in terms of campaigning for kind of rights and bits and pieces, whether that for, were for the people we support or the staff. And I think we kind of teamed up with Rights for Residents, as they were called at the time, to do a one-off show to talk about visiting. And that one-off show was really well received. And I think we managed to change a lot of companies introducing visiting. And then off the back of that, we were like, let's do another one in a month's time. And then I don't even really remember where that conversation took place about going live every Tuesday about a subject. But it's absolutely insane when you think that the pandemic was, what, two, two and a half years ago, it must be, if not longer. And we've been going live, bar the break, we take over Christmas, live every Tuesday. Um, but I think what's really nice is it's then had that knock-on impact with other people that are like, actually, we could do this. Let's use our voice to do that. And we see other other organisations now that don't necessarily do what we do, but do, you know, their own thing to create that kind of awareness in the sector, which is really nice. Yeah, and I, I just want to come back to you. I totally agree. And, you know, we take it on the road now, don't we? You know, we were um, in Manchester last week talking about um, sex and ageing and LGBT communities and actually having those conversations that people still feel are quite taboo. And everyone left the room, and I'm not saying this because I want people to follow us, but everyone left the room going, oh, my God, never thought about it that way. And it's a platform for everyone, not just us to sit there and talk, but for actually the people in the audience to come to us and go, this is what we do. And this is how we manage. Oh, brilliant. Give us your knowledge, please. We, we've given loads. Just give us some more. I really, really just want some more knowledge. And let's just share it. But it does come to be kind. And, it, you know, we do have to be aware that social media is a nasty place. And both Mark and I took quite a bit of slack um, throughout the entire pandemic when we were trying to advocate for safe access. You're going to kill your residents. You're going to kill your staff. You're going to do this. So there's two sides to it, and it's about having that strength, isn't it, about being kind. And I'm really glad you brought that up, Alison, because it is super, super important. So I want to know, where do we go from here? What's what's the plan now moving forward? Because the pandemic's behind us, um, and I say that with quite confidence now. Um, and this is where the finger pointing and the blame comes, and the sort of... The, the, the conversations on Twitter start coming back to finger pointing and blame and the post on LinkedIn come back to more about mental health and well-being. How do we keep the momentum going now around changing the narrative around social care? How, how's it working in Scotland? And jump in, anybody. Let's make this a friendly sort of wine and cheese conversation. Anyone can jump in. Um, I think there's loads of really, there's a great swell at the moment. And I kind of, that's what I really like about the, the social media aspect of what we're, what's kind of happening. And I think, I don't know if Kirsty will agree, but I think in Scotland, there's this great kind of like swell from the underbelly, if you like, in terms of like, let's make sure that we are getting in there and getting heard and getting kind of moving forward. And, and I mean that like, 
what's great about when I look at my, you know, my X or Twitter feed or whatever you want to call it, you know, I see on that feed all the time, new people coming in to say, I was like, oh, I didn't know that person was doing this. Let's, let's look at what they're doing. Or, um, you know, there's a fantastic number of people with lived experience who are owning those spaces, um, especially on X. And I named just a few because I think they're great. Gerald King um, who and uh, Willie Glider, Ron Coleman. Uh, all these guys are currently up at the Scottish Dementia Festival, the first arts festival in dementia. Um, so if you are having a chance to just kind of scroll through your Twitter feed tonight, make sure you kind of look for the hashtag Scott Dementia fest because there's some really interesting conversations being had there and I think that that's the thing like it doesn't have to be something massive it can be really beautiful small acts of kindness or kind of um small positive steps of change that are being marked in all these ways by individuals and I think for me that's the most exciting thing about these platforms at the moment is where people are beginning to feel more confident about owning some of those spaces and places to be like yeah you know what I'm going to tell people about that because Actually, it's important to just spread the word. Um, and I think we're seeing some of that come out of the of the kind of groundwork. And I think even like the work that um, is happening at the moment, with, like I think is it Neil Crowther's work on the social care change um, and also the NCS and the National Care Service that's being talked about in Scotland. You know, there's loads of really vibrant things happening in the political community around social care. And what we know is that these platforms are places where people are demonstrating opinions. So how do we add to that? How do we contribute? And how do we begin to kind of like, I love that Kirsty always posts like really, like really, what do you call it? Like really thoughtful kind of, um, things to just make you think and actually if you just are doom scrolling sometimes if you stop and you get a post that makes you go oh shit yeah oh sorry I don't know if we're allowed to swear on the <laughs> just think whatever you want Alison <laughs> it just means I have to log this is not safe for kids on YouTube after the show is gone live <laughs> but it's fine <laughs> My thing is that it's like actually it's creating moments of reflection and it's creating moments of reflection for everyone all of the time and actually we're better when we're reflective practitioners right so we're owning that I think yeah I'm quite excited I think there's lots of potential in the future I was just reading the comments there's one that hasn't pulled through from LinkedIn um, but from a lady called Zuva saying I'm just started um, I'm just getting started but yes I'd like to champion care workers um, and then we've got this one that's pulled through, just complimenting you both on the great work you're doing in Scotland using social care positively to promote social care. So Adam touched on it. And one thing, and especially for Zuva and others that are thinking about the journey and around kind of the trolls and, you know, some of the negative side of social media, how do you both deal with that whilst trying to send a positive message about whatever it is that you're trying to get across? Kirsty, I can see you on mic, so I'll come to you. Yeah. I think you've just got to be really aware that if you're sending a positive message, there's no point in getting into arguments with people. Um, some people literally just put things on just to get a response from you. And it's so much better just to let it pass than answer. Uh, I remember doing a presentation for... Um, I think it was at Scottish Care Conference last year about social media and one of the sort of take on advices of it was don't feed the trolls, just don't give them anything that they're just going to come back with. Everyone has a right to put their opinion and their opinion might not meet yours, but there's a difference between having a different opinion and just being unkind and being cruel to people. No, absolutely. Adam, and I know that obviously you've had a lot of trolls, just listening to Kirsty there, I always like to go back to them, just because I always see other people's viewpoint and just to try and learn from it. And you're right, oh, right, Kirsty, there are some people that you can then get into a conversation with and you can kind of see both sides. And there's some people that will literally just keep going and going and going because they've got no other agenda other than just to troll you. Adam, how did you cope with it? Because obviously you got quite a lot of negativity, didn't you? Um, I used to, to the text back and Oh, she's just message him back and go, oh, I'll tell Piers Morgan when I'm on ITV tomorrow morning and see what he says. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I never, I never. But at the end of the day, I would literally email them back and I'd just be like, look, what are your concerns about what I'm doing? What can I do to support you? 
is there anything that I can, you know, work with you on this? And nine times out of 10, they'll go, actually, I'm just really panicking because what you're saying is influencing our relatives and they're saying we must come into your home because this is what you're doing. And I'm like, well, that's great. How can we help you support that? How can we, no matter how that looks in your setting, because it will not look how it looks in mine. Granted, we had people opening presents and pulling crackers on the first Christmas during COVID because that's what we wanted to do. I wasn't trying to force anyone to do what we were doing. I was just trying to say, look, this is a different POV. This is how we're achieving it. This is how these people are achieving it. There are ways to do this than standing on the second floor, waving at people out of the window because there are there were just more humane ways, or, uh, humane ways around it. There were one or two people who got to the point where no matter what you said, it wasn't good enough for them. And they always wanted to come back with a point. And I just hit that block button. I really didn't care what they had to say. If they couldn't bring anything constructive to the conversation or to social care or to people's lives, because at the end of the day, we don't do this for fame or fortunes. Craggy, it's social care. You know, we're never going to have the Teslas and the Bentleys and, and all of that. And we're never going to have our names and lights. And yes, Mark, you and I did quite a lot of media during the pandemic. And that was fun and it was exciting. But actually, the main driving force between behind what Mark and I was doing was... How many lives will this impact? How many people will be able to die knowing that they've got their relatives around them? How many people will be able to spend their last couple of years with the people that matter to them most? And that's that was the driving force behind what we were doing. So I used, I used to just say to people, look, I'm not engaging in this any further. I do this to benefit the lives of people I'm supporting and supporting to live well. That's what I do. If that's not good enough for you, then I'm really, really sorry. But I have too much to be doing then to engage in this, this vitriol now. So... That's that. And then I just used to hit block and forget about them. And I sleep very well at night. So what about, and I mean, I can talk about what I would personally do because I've been there um, a couple of times. If you're very passionate about whatever it is that you want to, you know, talk about on social media. So for me, it's always around frontline staff, the care workers, the people that draw on social care. And then the registered managers, because I know what it's like that you kind of rushed off your feet. You never have time. And actually the support, you always give support to your staff, but never for yourself. And sometimes with them comes some negative. It can't always be positive that you're posting. Sometimes you have to put the negative because that's the truth of what's going on. Um, if the company you work for don't agree with the things that you're putting online, what what would your, do any of you have any advice? I mean, I'll talk about what I, I, I've done in the past, um, but I appreciate it. I thought, your, I thought your question was going to go to a different angle then. So I was like, already with an answer. And then you went, and your company don't agree. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any advice? Have you had that? I mean, in any of your organizations that you work for now, where actually they've questioned some of the things that you put online or kind of your viewpoints? I've not had it personally, like from the company or anything. I always make it clear through my account that my views are my own. Um, I obviously have the sort of responsibility of overseeing the social media sites for the care home as well, but I wouldn't post the same things on them as I would obviously um, in my own account. So, but I think if you ever came into that situation, it would be possibly a, a a chance to discuss why you're doing it and perhaps maybe the values of the organization and your own values um aren't connecting anymore um and it may make you question whether you are both heading in the same direction um i did have very early on in the pandemic um the situation where somebody from the health and social care partnership had had a wee phone call and said oh you know you've got to watch what you're saying um primarily because I was telling the truth that they didn't want out and <laughs> pretty much the answer was, a, well, I'm still going to say it. So, I suppose, I think for me, it's around having that open and candid approach with your employers and with everyone really to go, look, and it, it comes down to views of everything in, 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 in all aspects of life, doesn't it? Because everyone is going to have difference of opinions. Everyone's going to have difference of views. And it's around how do we foster now a really grown up atmosphere where we can go, oh, that's your opinion. That's great. This is my opinion. That's great. The world's not ended. We can have different thoughts and everyone's happy. And I suppose it's like Kirsty said, it's around figuring out where that divide is. Is your social media account that you're using attributed to your work? Because if your social media account is attributed to your work, 
boundaries. It's, it's, it's your work account and that's what's happening. Let's look at Carol Vorderman. She's quit the BBC because she's not allowed to wear any of her views on any of her social medias, even though she only works there like something like five hours a week or something crazy, isn't it? And that's only part of what her work is. I think good on it. No one should be silenced on their own social medias. If Carol Vorderman's social media was just like, I'm that, that leggy, sexy lady from Countdown and these are my views, I don't see why that would be a problem. If it was, I'm from the BBC and I work for the BBC, but I'm going to have these views, there's a difference. But I think it's just around being open and honest with your employers and going, look, these are my views and my opinions. I'd love to know what your views and opinions are, it are because like Kirstie's just said, I work for you. And if we're working in a way that goes against my values, I'm going to struggle with that and I need to be honest with you. And I'd love to know what it is that we can do to work in the best way for the people that we're supporting um, or if there's anything we can meet in the middle. And so it's not a surprise to them. I'm not saying sit down with them before every single tweet or every post on LinkedIn, but just be saying, look, this is my thoughts. These are my views. I'm not going to influence the team or the people we support, but I will have an avenue where I'm going to say that online. I'm just letting you know that. Um, also, you can feign um, anonymity and do what Kirsty does and use a different screen name, which I think is a really clever idea because it doesn't stick out. But we shouldn't feel like we have to do that. So that would be my sort of advice is just be open and honest to everybody and just reassure them that you're not going to be then forcing those opinions on other people or getting nasty towards other people who have different opinions. You know, during the pandemic, Mark and you and I, we never turned around to people and went, oh my God, this is disgusting. I cannot believe you're let not letting people in your home. We used to go, well, we're letting people in ours and this is how we're doing it to ours. And it was actually the people who weren't doing what we were doing that were the ones getting angry. Because I think they felt this, this fear of, oh my God, how are they achieving that? Why aren't we doing that? Are people going to look down on us? And that wasn't the case. It was a terrifying, bloody time. And I don't judge anyone for the decisions that they made because the guidance we were getting was wrong. It's just about, like Alison said, being kind. And like Kirsty said, just having those difference of opinions and, and working with them properly and, and just being open and honest. No, absolutely. That's probably really crap advice. No, no, I think it's really good advice, Alison. Well, um, oh. um, sorry. Uh, I suppose I'm in a really privileged position because um, my mum is my boss, so she kind of like you know just lets me get on with it um and so i've never i, I and that sense i've never felt the need to self-center for my employer and um, because it's a family business and i think for us it is about making sure that we can represent our voice as individuals and that's the very reason like we do not have a company twitter we have our individual facebook pages for our care homes to be able to share you know what's happening in them for our family members and private groups but we don't have or, or we don't claim we're one of those companies right we don't claim that linkedin profile um because actually i think it's really important that people are able to have that opportunity to have their own voice you know and if somebody does post something that is theirs and they are owning it as their own and not via our organization they can be more honest and they can be more vulnerable maybe even or they can be more true to themselves on what they want to say um and i wouldn't want people to be censoring themselves um because of us as an employer half the time my staff are going stop we don't like to, no but no like you know because they don't want to necessarily do those things and they don't want to post on twitter or whatever you know it's a bit of a joke that i just post everything on Twitter and they're like, um, but I think part of that is about what I want to get for them is the recognition of the great work and the great things that they're doing. And I feel so privileged to be able to be a bit of a vehicle for that, for, for the work that they're doing to be kind of like able to be shared in that space and place. And I want them to be able to feel confident to amplify that. And what that's kind of meant over time, you know, because when I went onto Twitter, it was under the influence of someone else who was working for our company at that time. And she was a Twitter celebrity, you know, she was all the person, she had all the followers. And I really respected that. And I could see what she was able to achieve and things that she was doing are really inspiring. And I think I just kind of followed that trend, if you like, from her. Uh, and then I wanted to encourage everybody else because I could see what an impact it was having in people feeling more confident about who they were. And I think kind of going back on some of the things that we were saying before, the reality is, is like, I genuinely think you never know 
the character you play in someone else's story. And I think if you worry so much about who you are in that place and what you are to them, then you do absolutely get yourself bogged down in where it is. And I know I've been that person who's going, oh my God, what do they think of me? What do they think about me? What do they think about me? At the, re- the end of the day, I think it is about growing and building your own confidence to be actually, I do believe in this stuff and I believe in what I'm saying. And yeah, I post a massive mix of things from like, the stuff when I'm feeling really rubbish to the stuff where I'm feeling really great because I do think like Kirsty, it's a massive roller coaster in this sector and it's a massive roller coaster and people need to people need to remember we are human and we do have those journeys so that they can be given the permission to know that it's okay not to be okay and I think there's a lot of what's happening in the community there that is about that like it's okay if you're having a really rubbish time with that external agency because guess what we've all been there and we will be here to support you. And I think that that's what I love about what's happening in Scotland right now is there is a network of people who are coming together. But actually, a lot of it is about your role is left at the door. And it's really just about human beings and relationships building and connecting. And I think like what we're really concentrating on here as well is that global network. Like how can we take that even further still and be connected to each other? And I think we're we're in a place and space now with AI, with like all the technology and things we have, that it risks us losing that human connection. But I think when we are able to be human ourselves in that space, then we can, you know, just really continue to promote and encourage, you know, so I mean, I, for example, have like posted ridiculous pictures of myself looking awful. Um, Or I've posted pictures where I'm like, I need to get my really pretty side here. Like, I want to look okay. Like, you know, because actually (laughs) I'm a human being and I want to kind of have that. It's about honesty. And I genuinely believe about honesty is so important. You have to have integrity. You have to be honest. And again, I think the people that inspire me on Twitter are those people like Kirsty who are always so honest. And that honesty shines through. You can see who your spinners are, right? You can see those spinners. You can tell the ones that are kind of moving around the place, talking about how great everything is all the time. And then you've got the people who are telling the real story. And I think that that's like so important. Um, so, so important. No, absolutely. Um, I've written a few notes because there's some bits that I want to come back to. So I just wanted to talk because I know obviously we've got people that are on the beginning of their journey and there will be things when you're passionate that you might be very, and I'll, I'll use an example. I've always been very passionate about frontline pay, that they shouldn't be on minimum wage. And probably five years ago, I just said they needed to be on £12. And then for the last kind of definitely during the pandemic, since the pandemic, at least £15 an hour. Now, when I joined my organisation, staff weren't anywhere near £12 an hour. But actually, I always felt like I can't preach one thing on social media and then do very different. And the same with work-life balance for registered managers. I can't expect the registered manager that I manage not to have a good work-life balance when actually I'm there on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever talking about actually these are the things we should be doing for our teams. But it obviously then gets you in a lot of heat with your organisation because you're making decisions within the organisation that reflect your own values. Um, And one thing that kind of came a cropper for me um, against my values getting to the organisation is obviously during COVID I was campaigning heavily around the rights of learning disabilities and the vaccine because they weren't eligible and getting that change through government and we were the first care home in the UK to have vaccines for people with a learning disability and the staff to get vaccine which is something I was really proud of achieving and I never campaigned because I wanted it to be my care home first I campaigned because I didn't think it was right so our care home was vaccinated and then they were vaccinated with the second dose And then the organisation I worked for at the time didn't want me to do campaigning anymore. But for me, I'd met so many relatives that told me how, you know, the campaign had really, you know, touched them because actually they've got loved ones that live with a learning disability either with them or in a care sector. I felt like I had a duty of care to carry on campaigning because part of me felt like, oh, they just vaccinated my staff in the residence just to keep it quiet on social media. And I didn't want to stop that journey. But you are right when you say, Kirsty, you need to have that conversation with your employer which is what I did, which was actually, I don't want to stop. And actually, I want to make sure that I follow this through. And it might not be the last thing, because actually before this, it was around actually, how do we get PPE? Because we weren't eligible for PPE because it all went to the health services. Um, So I think there is finding that balance and that middle ground with an organisation. And I think, obviously, Alison, you're very lucky that you don't have to worry about that. And I think I said earlier that, you know, I'm very lucky that I, you know, there's a lot of jobs. I live in an area where, you know, we're on 
on the edge of London and Hertfordshire and all these other places where actually there are a lot of jobs. Whereas I know I've spoken to people that would love to be more active on social media, but they live in a coastal seaside town. So you're kind of very limited of where you can get a job unless you're going to travel for miles or catch a train somewhere. And I think when you're starting on that journey, you need to be really mindful of what your values are, but also that the company does align with them because otherwise you're going to get called out very quickly if you're posting about it continuously, but you're not doing it in kind of in your day-to-day -day life. But equally, if you're posting something you're passionate about, maybe it's something personal, and then all your friends see it on your Facebook or Instagram or wherever, because again, they're going to call that out because actually they're going to say, actually, that's not who you are. And I think we see that, don't we, on um, TikTok, that people let their guard down and you see a very different side of people on TikTok than you do on any other social media. I'm talking about Adam here. No, I'm not really. <laughs> but I also want to talk about comments. Um, and I wrote it down. And Adam, I'm going to come to you because I think when you're passionate about something, I think you might see something that you either don't agree with or you might agree with it. And you might write something in the comments, not thinking anything of it. But what we don't often remember is that actually the algorithm will show that comment to all of your followers, followers and other people that have maybe searched that keyword. And Adam, I want to bring you in about, and I can't remember what the post was, but there was the guy on LinkedIn that had dropped into your comments that obviously then ended up out of a job. And oh, actually, my days. Right. So I hope you're sat there with popcorn, Mark, because this is, you've just reminded me of the most amazing thing that ever happened on LinkedIn for me. And you are right. I mean, I panic because I get a lot of thirst traps on TikTok and I'm like, oh, slay and i'm like oh my god who's gonna see that and i get really panicky no i don't uh, well no i do but i don't um but no it was on it was on linkedin and it was around it was in fact no it was a post made by a friend of ours who's also a social care colleague in and and had been visiting edinburgh well she was in scotland anyway she lives in scotland and she'd been to edinburgh pride and she was like, oh, this is amazing. It's wonderful. And it's really, really great. And it's just great seeing everyone together. And it's just fabulous. And this chap had commented something along the lines of, I don't understand why we have these pride parades. Um, it's a waste of money and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, yeah, but it's it's a really good event for people. It's great that social care is getting involved. And I think it's a, a really wonderful thing that should be happening. And the conversation just went on this really bizarre sort of line. And he was going, well, my niece is gay. Um, but she's one of those that you can't really tell because she doesn't scream about it. And I'm like, so basically she lives in a family that she doesn't feel comfortable being in because she can't present as the person that she truly is within her heart and soul. And we, it went on this massive tirade. And I thought, Do you know what? I'm leaving it, mate, because he was starting to get really sort of diggy. Um, so I did a whole post on my thing and I was just like, don't be like this on social media. Just be a good person. I blanked his name out. I didn't put his name up on my post because I thought that's unfair. I don't want to be the reason why anyone gets any sort of hate mail sent to them. But actually, this is something that I care so much about. Just look, people don't be like this on social media. If you don't agree, just don't say. And it's really, really simple. The stuff I don't agree with, I just don't say anything about it. Unless it's something hateful that's causing harm and hurt to people. I don't get involved if I don't like it. Anyway. So he then started commenting all over my post about this and really sort of digging in, being very passive aggressive. And I think about two days had passed, hadn't it, Mark? And he was like, he put a post up on social media and was like, so I've decided over the weekend and I've given it some thought that I'm going to take voluntary redundancy from my organization. And it was like, no, 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 your business has found out how you've been acting online and you've been asked to step down. And it's so important that... It's, it's really easy to have opinions and it's really easy to forget the internet's forever. And it's really easy to forget how far those things spread. Um, I would just say to people, type out your comment and before you hit send, before you hit send, just read it back to yourself and go, if I was the person that had posted this and I'm reading this comment, how would I feel? How would I feel? what would the impact be on me? Because if it wouldn't be a very nice impact, and we see this more on TikTok, there's a there's like a filter that has been dissolved in society and people just post the most hateful comments now and don't even think about it. They don't care about the impact on people, especially around people with disabilities who are living their best life on social media and the comments are awful. Just sit there and think to yourself, if I was reading that about me, honestly, don't be big and bravado going, oh, it wouldn't bother me. It probably would. If that's going to be the case, just don't do it. Just don't post it. But if you've got to physically type it out to realize that, great. Just just reflect on it before you post it because it's easier to not post 
than it is to then take that away. Because it takes two seconds to screenshot something and that well, that's it, isn't it? And it's it is super important. I've got thick skin through it all now, but there are people out there who really take it to heart and it's unfair. Was that what you were talking about, Mark? Or did I just get excited and go off on a tangent? No, it was that one. Because I think it's very easy that actually if you're very anti something or passionate about something, that that can then lead to and like you said, it's so easy to screenshot something. And we see it all the time where people, you know, we see it with celebrities, don't we, or somebody that they put a comment up and then they take it down because they know actually that probably wasn't right or it doesn't fit in with their brand. But it's already been screenshot, you know, 500 times. And I think I look at TikTok, for example, the amount of times when you're watching something and you just screen record it. And then, you know, it's all you ever see all over the social is people kind of talking about that. And it's just like you said, Adam, it's there for the world to see. Um, what did I write down earlier that I wanted to come back to? Global spaces was one of them right at the top. So I think that actually in terms of social care, we do really well around connecting in the UK, but I don't feel like we necessarily do it wider than the UK. Um, so Adam and I have got a couple of, um, contacts, um, Denmark and America, but that's just one person, no one else. And it's really interesting just to kind of touch base every now and again and see what's happening in social care in other parts of the world. Um, America doesn't, it isn't um, regulated like it is here. Some parts are and some parts aren't. Denmark's obviously further ahead in terms of social care being a profession. And I think it's it's really interesting. And I just wondered whether speaking to the both of you and Adam, you can chip in as well, is where you think we could take that next step into how we create that kind of true global kind of voice and unite and i think it's hard because we obviously have different terminology than they do in other countries and that won't always always then hit the algorithm in bits and pieces but how we might be able to connect more and learn from other other countries and other you know different cultures around because actually ultimately it might impact the people that we're supporting either of you got any ideas <laughs> I think it's about reaching out as much as possible and once you make one connection trying to use that as a catalyst to make more and more connections in other countries because you're right we do have to learn so much and I think over the pandemic we were more aware of what was happening in other countries because it was in the news all the time because it was dare I say it because it was bad news we don't often hear the good news enough and I think that's a social media thing in general that we really need to accentuate the positive um, the way I always see it is I wouldn't want somebody to be terrified of coming into a care home by looking at a post that came um, from a care home um, but we see things all the time that I suppose just make us curious we hear something, we see something and we've got that power now just at the click of a few fingers Like you see something, you see somebody's name on a research article or something you think oh that sounds really interesting you can now just go and look them up and you could connect with them in seconds find out more about them, see what they're talking about. And I think if more people just got curious and did that, we would be able to connect on a much more global scale. Alison, anything from you? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, um, I don't think I'd ever considered any global kind of perspective really until GAN, the Global Aging Network Conference that we were quite privileged came to Scotland this year. Um, and I think that was the first time I had ever considered a global stage for what it was that we were doing and how we're doing things and, and how we can share and, and connect with one another in that way. Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> but what, um, <coughs> what I was very conscious of at the Global Aging Network and their conference that they held, and apparently they hold these conferences all the time and quite regularly, was actually quite conscious how consciously different providers are or people working in social care and their stature within their own communities and societies was in comparison to other international colleagues. They saw themselves as pillars of the community. They weren't kind of like, um, they had the confidence that we maybe didn't have. You know, I think if you look at the international network and the community that came for that conference in Glasgow, the majority of speakers were actually people who had come to Scotland and then spoke and did things. There wasn't the same confidence from our national or local teams to be able to feel at place in those environments. And I think that like we can learn so much from so many other places. 
And I think that that was a, the first time it really kind of opened my eyes to the potential of that. And yes, there are a lot of real local issues that we need to kind of tap into. And I think local is really important. And I think in some respects, when we become more local and we do the hyper local. So alongside the work I do with my own organization, we've just started um, the Fife Care Home Cooperative, which is about local providers in Fife connecting with one another to feel an opportunity of unification and amplifying voices and so on to rep ourselves, represent ourselves at equal parity with the partnership and so on. But it's all about that the, the nature of a network. And I think the global aspect like you spoke about and, and Kirsty kind of touched on is human relationships. It's like, how can we make those connections? And how can we continue to invest in those connections that will be able to be mutually beneficial? Um, and I think that I'm not sure how we can continue to sustain that. Some of that was started for me anyway and the experiences I had in Glasgow and the people that I connected and followed at that time and how I can see what's going on in different places. But I think we want to have, or we, or we have to claim a pride in what we do and how we do it. And, and I think that would be really great to kind of then take that to the next step and um, own it. And I think, I think even now, like think about how far we've come, right? I didn't know either of you guys before COVID. Um, and that was only three years ago. Um, and I think about the culture shift that's happened in the provision and collaboration. I'm a massive collaborator. Um, I really feel so passionately about working with other people to make things better. And I think that like, I have this great meme, which I quite like to use on Twitter quite often, which is like collaboration is cool and they're doing a wee monkey dance. And like, because it is, it is cool. It is cool to like have pals and like make things better, right? And that's at the end of the day, what we're talking about. And I think that, um, yeah, I've kind of strayed off a little bit, but I think like for me, it's all about that collaborative potential. Uh, and I think that's something that we can really continue to grow, definitely. I'm keen to know, where are we getting it wrong here? Why don't we have within our communities, within our workforces, why don't we have that pride? Why don't we go out there every single day and go, I'm gonna have a great day today. And then why don't we come home and go, I'm so proud of what I've done. And I'm so proud of working in care. And I'm, you know, my neighbors are really proud of me for what I do. And everyone thinks I'm a pillar of the community and it's brilliant we don't get seen like that here and it's a million dollar question and it's one i've been asking for years mark's been asking for years we've all been asking for years why why are why, why are our views in this country the way they are and how do we change them and i, I think, think sorry oh, sorry no i was no. gonna say because it, it really is really something that bugs me the whole time right it's something i'm really really like because i think we exist in a culture of mistrust there's a mistrust in this country of the services we provide and what we do. And that's evidenced every single day by the fact that like carers can't just do their work on the front line. They've got to document it. Staff can't, um, care homes can't go about doing day to day stuff without having to document it. We all know that kind of thing is like if it didn't document it, it didn't happen. You know, we live in a culture of mistrust and we don't almost trust ourselves to be able to deliver what we're delivering. And I think that that's perpetuated by the external pressures that we have from care inspectors still do unannounced inspections. Who's that for? You know, I know I know that there is absolutely no way that I could, if I was in a home that was struggling, I can't change it all on that day if I knew the care inspectors were coming. But I tell you what, if I was going to make changes, those would be positive changes, surely. And a clever enough inspector would be able to turn around and tell me whether those had been sustainable changes or changes made for inspection. And I think until we change some of those you know, ways in which we are um, scrutinized and moderated and, and regulated and all of those things, we're not going to be able to move past that. And I think that's a real shame. And that's going to take a lot of time to influence that change, I think. And COVID was the start of it. I really believe that. I think it's how we're seen as a career, isn't it, in social care? I think when we spoke earlier about Denmark um, and Alison, you spoke about people that came over to the gang conference, is that it's just not seen as a career. And it was interesting that people had come over to Scotland to talk because it then made me think actually in England, we attend all these events, but you're never, generally speaking, not never, but generally speaking, you're never paid, your costs aren't covered, so actually, if you're really passionate about something, then you're out of pocket, normally by two days, the hotel fee, food or whatever else it is. And I think the other reason that sometimes we get it wrong is that I think 
there's people out there that see social care as easy pickings in terms of they see a gap in the market and they can come in and take that space and then become an expert in that field. And, you know, I see it all the time on social media. People are talking about, would you like, you know, this as a registered? And I think, well, I've just looked at your LinkedIn profile and you've never been a registered manager. So how are you offering that advice to other registered managers if you've never been in that job? Or people that talk about, I don't know, all sorts of things and, you know, around data and digital and falls or, you know, security in care homes. And I think you've never even worked in a care home. So how do you know what the security and falls prevention is like? But I think they end up being on a platform because people can resonate with what they're saying. Then they become the leader in that. But I think around them, us that work in the sector, see them as a phony and a fake. And I think that we're always tearing each other down for that, because as opposed to us calling them out saying, actually, why are you campaigning about this? Because you've never done it. So how do you know? We just kind of let them go on and on. But actually, we just talk about it behind them, if that makes sense, which I, I don't think, think helps. No, and I think there's a whole conversation, Mark, here that I would love to have at some point. And it, it comes down to things like tech developers, you know, because it's like, oh, care homes or people in social care need this device to be able to talk to people and be able to do this. Yeah, it exists. It's an Apple Watch or it's an Apple phone or it's a Kindle or it's something that actually exists. Are we saying that people in social care can't use normal technology? And I hate to use the word normal because it's an awful word and shouldn't be in our dictionaries. But technology is out there for the masses. Why do we have to give people millions and millions and millions of pounds to develop stuff that's never going to pass a pilot scheme and get used? And actually, it's a waste of money. And that money can then get fed back into the services the way that it probably should be done. I do feel like social care is abused from all angles. And I just want to touch on what you were saying, Alison, because this is a conversation I had today and I was very passionate about it, is documentation. And oh my God, I remember, and I've only been in social care for the last 15 years. And even when I started in social care, I remember cardexes were written as all care given, settled day, full stop. That was it. That was it. And now people are coming and like, how many activities have you done today? And they've not done this and you've not documented that. And they've walked out of this room. Have you documented that? No. Because I'm providing them the care. If my loved one was in a service, I would rather the carer spend more time with them than more time documenting. And I would rather judge my mum's care based on life outcomes rather than what's been written. Because anyone can write anything. Life outcomes mean more. And if those life outcomes are poor, obviously the care isn't great. If those life outcomes are great, obviously the care is great. And we don't we don't focus on people's outcomes anymore. And I don't understand it. Digital social care records, we've dug a hole for ourselves. We've made a rod for our own back because it's so easy to document everything now. Everyone wants everything documenting. And I don't know how we escape this. And, th and this is only going to be, we'll, we'll, we'll only come to a... a a sort of happy solution with this if people start talking out and people start saying to the people who've never run a care home or worked in a care home, look, it's just not possible. It just isn't possible. This is how we're doing it and this is how we measure and this is what we want to go with. But I think until we have that confidence to speak up, and in fact, someone mentioned on LinkedIn earlier and it's not pulled through to here, the Lucy Letby situation happened because people are afraid to say anything. You know, and I know that's a drastic thing to say, but it is true. Lucy Letby happened because people were afraid to say anything. And that is historic throughout our culture. People don't say anything because they're afraid to say anything. And then when things go wrong or things aren't satisfactory, they go, oh, God, I can't believe social care is the way it is now. Why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you say this isn't going to be great? This is why being an influencer, I don't know, just take it. Don't be one of those people that, you know, you think they're going to be on TV and they're like, so this is the sort of makeup that I use and it's this swatch colour and I do this and can you see? Well, you're doing that fast, too fast, Adam, because they never actually really show their product and you're like, rewind and slow it down and you're like, still can't figure out what it is and there's 100 people yeah, in the no, that's it's wonderful and it's clearly not because it looks trash. But... <laughs> Be an influencer of thought, be an influencer of emotions, be an influencer of society and community and heart and soul. And it will just be so much better. But I, it's just, I am fed up with people dictating to, the roundabout I had a crash on last night, and I'm going to say this, was designed by somebody who can't drive. The person who designed that roundabout does not drive. And it's like, what on earth? Why are we allowing people who have no expertise and knowledge in the areas that we are so experienced in 
And why are we allowing them to dictate to us how we should operate and how we should work things? And that's why Mark and I did what we did through the pandemic. That's why we came up with not challenging, but curious ways of working. How can we be different? How can we work differently? Just to basically go to people, look, we know you've never done this job, so we'll help you. And we'll give you some insight. I'm going to stop ranting, Mark, because I can feel it bubbling. But let's do a show on something like this at some point. You are, you are right around documentation. As you were talking, I was thinking back to my LD days. The amount of times that the, the CQC or the local authority during their ADAS inspection, well, where's the bowel chart and the fluid chart? Well, they don't have a problem with their bowels and they're fully capable of getting a drink and going into the kitchen themselves because there's not a lock on the door. So why would we be intruding and monitoring that when there is no concern, you know, and actually, you know, and but the amount of pushback and it was all the time and then it would reflect in the report that they didn't have monitoring in place and then you'd have to challenge that and get it removed. But it was such a lengthy, pro and I do understand why providers, providers just don't want that battle, but then actually we're not doing right by the people we're supporting. If you're putting measures in place that then either restrict them because a fluid chart ultimately would restrict them because they'd be monitored against the amount of fluid going in or you'd be pushing it on them because you want to make sure actually they are having that much and you kind of take around away some of that choice but there's a third scenario there as well mark and it's putting documentation in place that isn't required and because it's not required it's not second nature to the person providing the care and support for that person so because someone might not have issues with the bowels probably doesn't get recorded because they're frequent and regular and they just think Do you know what there's no issues here so then cqc will come down like oh we've not completed this it's like but they don't have a problem with that and they shouldn't be on it anyway. You're making yourself a target for failure by putting it in for everyone. I see Kirst is unmuted. Come in, Kirst. Yeah, I was just actually going to say, though, that there's that whole thing about bravery and confidence again to actually change things that happen where you work. And that is the big benefit of being on social media and influencing others and being influenced by others. The amount of times that I have seen other people's practice and that's influenced mine. There is that safety in numbers and the more people that know each other and get together and can actually not just sing from the, the same hymn sheet, but actually get that choir going, then we've got a much better chance of standing up against all these other people that are stepping in to say, no, we're going to tell you how to do it. We'll be like shouting loud or singing loudly back saying, no, we'll tell you how to do it. Um, but I think in a lot of places still, there's so many little pockets of people that, like managers in that, who just don't communicate with anybody else. And it's a shame we really need to get people together more. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just conscious that the live thing has just popped over the one hour mark. So before we close out, um, I just want to go do a round robin. Um, I'll start because then it can end on Adam to close out the show because he loves closing out the show. Um, <laughs> I absolutely hate doing it. It gives me anxiety that the um, it won't end up not going live or the banner doesn't start. So I absolutely hate it. Just hand it to Adam. Um, just one tip for social media and our, or kind of yeah. using your voice um, or just any general tip, whatever you want to give a tip on. Um, I'll go first and give you so a couple of um, couple of minutes. It's only going to be a couple of seconds, not a couple of minutes. Don't get too carried away. Um, so mine would be around, and it was something that I did want to speak tonight, about how often you post. Because I think I get a lot of people that say to me, how do you do it? How do you post all the time? And I think then subconsciously you think, oh, should I be posting all the time? Because I don't feel like I post all the time. I just kind of post when something pops into my head or I see something and I share it. Um, and I think we need to take that off us because I think we're always told, Google SEO, you need to be posting every day and to get the algorithm, you need to be posting this and in the morning or in the evening and find out, you know, look at the data analytics and find out when you like, like people that interact are like, you know, most interact. And I just think sod that, like if you've got something that you want to say, post it. And if you haven't got anything to say for a few days, then don't post it because I think then you get a genuine following because you're not posting content that you've got to pre-think about. And actually, sometimes you've just got a lot of stuff going on and you just don't have time to jump on and post and respond to the messages. Because I think we haven't even touched on that. You might post lots, but then you still got to remember all the comments to go back to or the messages that come in with people that have further questions. Um, so I think just take that pressure off you, regardless of how many followers you've got, is actually you have to remember that you're a person at the end of the day in your personal life, in your family life and everything there 
comes first and foremost before what you're putting out onto your social media and social media is always going to be there and actually if you let your relationship slide they might not always be there Alison or Kirsty, who wants to go next I'll go um I guess my two tips would be be brave say what's on your mind and don't not to know as long as you're being kind and be authentic to yourself say what needs to be said but also be curious so don't always think that you have to say something amazing sometimes it's good just to put a fishing post out there and get other people's views on things because it can generate the most wonderful conversations absolutely great tip alison Oh, a great minds think alike, Kirsty. So I've just literally written "be curious" is my thing I was going to say, but I think it's um it's all about that for me. It's like you know, um, in that way, be curious, allow yourself to get taken down the rabbit hole, um, but also don't judge yourself. Like I think I, I struggle with the whole work life balance thing, and maybe it's because I don't really have one. My work is my life, and my life is my work, and I am passionate about it, and that's okay. So if I choose to do these things, these are choices I'm making. And whilst I can still make those choices, I'm not going to judge myself for that. So I think it's just about being okay with whatever it is that you can contribute, you can do. Um, and as my coach told me the other day, enough is okay. Great advice. And I hope your coach has got some experience of what they're talking about and hasn't just become a coach for the sake of being a coach there. <laughs> Adam, final thoughts from you. So for me, it's if you're on Facebook, don't check yourself in a safe at a hospital and then not reply to people's comments. It's like, DM me, babes. I'm sure I'm, you know, don't do that. No, 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 no. For me, it's around being proud and just be proud of who you are and proud of what you achieve. Don't care about whatever, what anyone else is doing. I've got this huge thing around keeping up with the Joneses. I had a huge imposter syndrome when I first met Mark because, I mean, he is on it like a car bonnet on social media. And he used to think to myself, oh, my God, I need to do as much as Mark. I need to do as much as Mark. Not in my DNA, mate. I, I can't do social media all the time. I will post something, and then I'll, like, go back on LinkedIn four days later. There's, like, hundreds of comments and likes and stuff. I'm like, oh, crumbs. I need to reply to people. I just can't do it. So, disclaimer, if I post on social media, I'm probably not going to reply anymore because I'm just terrible at it. And I think that is because I'm, I'm learning to live my life again, and I'm learning to live outside of that virtual world. And it's around use social media when it matters to you. You know, business-wise, Use your, your team and your work and your organization to manage that recruitment, you know, your publicity, all of that. Do that through your organization, your work. Don't take that on yourself as an individual. It's not for you to do. When it comes down to yourself and to promote yourself or to connect with people, do it in your own time. Do it when it matters to you most and do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because you think other people think you should be doing it. So don't sit here watching this tonight going, oh, tomorrow I'm going to go on LinkedIn. I'm going to start messaging hundreds of people because there is a limit and LinkedIn will tell you off. But actually, only do it if you care about it. Only do it when it means something and when it matters to something. Follower numbers, likes, shares, retweets, none of that matters. You know, just like money, you can't take that with you when you're gone. So focus more on the experiences and the thoughts of how many lives and thoughts and minds you're changing and inspiring. That's all that matters, nothing else. So take it easy and don't take it too seriously and just be proud of what you do. And that's how you get where you want to be. Great tip. But in terms of likes, there is well, one... Like, in terms of likes, though, I've got loads of likes. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> there is one like that I would like everybody to do which would be, because I know that we get a lot of people listening tonight on LinkedIn, is please do head over to our YouTube and hit subscribe because that's the easiest way to be notified of all of our upcoming episodes. It will notify you. Um, so we're scheduled all the way through now until I think February 2024 and we're in conversations. Um, so if you do want to join us, please do let me know. But yeah, I think we've got all of them out until the end of the year now that are up on our YouTube so you can subscribe you'll be notified when we're going live in bits and pieces but yeah that's the only like that we like to like to bang yeah like all of our social medias i mean we're doing this for free we're not we're not <laughs> you know making money from this give us loads of likes on on the caring view we don't care um no but it is really just around sharing that knowledge and 
this is a platform for everyone, not just for us, elevating, educating, and celebrating all things social care. In fact, I just had a quick look onto our podcast earlier on this evening, because although we've not got a new series going out at the moment, and that's partly down to myself being incredibly busy and Mark taking the brunt of all the uh, care and view work, and I need to get him a massive Christmas present this year. Um, we do have our rewind episodes that are going out of shows that we've had over the last 12 months. And financial well-being was the last one we put up uh, the other week, was it, Mark? And we were already at like 1,100 plays just on that financial well-being episode. So all of those tips and that knowledge, and that's with HSBC and uh, KP Financial Wellbeing, so much knowledge being shared out there, completely free. You know, go and utilize it, go and benefit from it. Um, other people are doing it as well, and we will start linking in with more people within our hubs on our Facebook, uh, on our web page as well. We're not precious about the information and the knowledge and where it comes from, as long as everyone gets to get access to it. That's all we care about. So, well over time tonight. Uh, huge demerits for Mark and I uh, for our, our timekeeping skills. Don't forget to go to www.thecareinview.co.uk. Can we all say a huge thank you to Kirsty and Alison for giving up their Tuesday evenings for us tonight. Um, if you're like me, we're going to run to the living room in a second and find out who's been evicted out of Bake Off because it is getting to the final now and it's really exciting. Um, we will be back next week. It's Quentin Tarantino's favourite week next week. It's all about feet. Um, so we're talking about foot health um, and have we been shortchanged in social care? So the question I am asking, get on social media, send us your likes, send us your comments, but is it chiropody or chiropody? And I really want to know by next Tuesday's episode, which it is, chiropody or chiropody. But until then, Mark, a huge thank you for tonight. Kirsty, Alison, thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely great, www.thecareinview.co.uk, and we will see you next Tuesday. Take care, everyone. Good night.